Human Rights Rights Association of Nigeria has accused security agents and the federal government of being dishonest in its fight, fight against banditry and insurgency in the country. The group also accused heads of security agencies of looking uh, the other way as Fulani terrorists in, import sophisticated weapons into the country through the Northwest, which they use to terrorize Nigerians. The group's national coordinator, Emmanuel Omubiko, uh, said it was hypocritical of the government of President Muhammad Buhari to continue prosecuting the leader of the indigenous people of Biafra, Namdi Kanu, while leaving the notorious bandit kingpin, Belo Toruji, to continue terrorizing residents of the Northwest Zone. Now, the HURIWA said the current administration is full of double standards. Well, joining us to discuss this, we have Raymond Kanebe, he's a legal practitioner. We also have Dr. Law Mefo, he's a public policy analyst. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me, Maria. All right, so uh, I'm going to start with you, Raymond, before we go to um, Mefo. Yeah. Um, looking at the, the position of the um, Human Rights Writers Association, they're saying it's a case of double standards. And... This may not be the first time somebody's pointing accusation f fingers at the federal government in terms of uh, prosecution. Uh, let's not forget the Attorney General has been fingered in this report and other you know, judicial officers. Is that really truly the case and um, why? Okay, well, thanks for having me. So I, I think um, it's important for us to put this issue in the proper context. Now, I read um, the, the report from the uh, organization and they're basically saying that um, because the, the bandit or the terrorist, uh, Belo Toruji, has been allowed to terrorize uh, communities in the northwestern part of the country, and Namdi Kanu has been prosecuted uh, by the federal government, that means there's a case of double standard. Now, uh, for me, I think that is, um, it comes to me as a rather sweeping statement and uh, borders on undue generalization, because uh, uh, the, the data is not there. The Belo Torji guy who is being referenced, uh, to the best of my knowledge, he's still under, he's still hiding, he's still running away from the security operatives. Don't forget that this is a man who has killed even uh, security operatives. And um, uh, he's been, he's, he's on the run. So uh, until he's been apprehended by the security agencies and and disciplinary actions or prosecution, prosecution is not being commenced against him in court. That is only that is when uh, the statement can be can be can be held to hold water. The fact that a journalist uh, was able to get across to this young man and had an interview with with him and then published it is not a proof that he's been uh, he's been allowed to operate um, uh, 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 as he pleases. All over the world, it's an acceptable practice for journalists to engage with non-state actors. As a matter of fact. There are people who still engage with uh, Iswap terrorists and even uh, uh, Mohamed Shekau, before we heard he had been killed. There are terrorists who, had a, a, who engaged with them from the back end. You understand? So under the, under the rules of international law and, or international humanitarian law, it is accepted. It is an acceptable practice. Because, so you get information from the standpoint of the non-state actors so that the state actors will also process that information and also use it to fine-tune their strategy. So it is not a proof, uh, per se, that there is a clear case of... Uh, 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 discrimination in terms of prosecution. I don't agree with that, with that statement. Do you think that if the federal government really is serious about getting Toruji, that they will get him? Well, I think the federal government has what it takes to, to, to get him. When you look at the size of the, the federal government, the high, the, it has all the military apparatus at its disposal. You have the security, you have the military, you have the police, and so on and so forth. So in principle, one would, one would say that. But when you are dealing with um, this kind of insecurity situation, you are dealing with guerrilla warfare and unconventional warfare, it's, it's not as simple uh, as it seems. Okay. So these guys, they hide in the forest. They don't have a particular place where they are stationed. They have a way of maneuvering and maneuvering. So they keep eloping the security operatives. And it is not as if some of his men or lieutenants have not been killed. There have been reports where military operatives shelled their camps. A lot of them were killed. But this young man, for one reason or other, has continued to elope the security agencies. But it doesn't mean that 
he's been seen and then uh, uh, and then been allowed to continue what he's doing. Uh, as put by the um, Human Rights Crisis Association. Exactly. Um, Mr. Mefor, let, let's talk about this position by the Human Rights Crisis um, uh, Group. Now, they're also saying that the National Broadcasting Commission uh, had done nothing after this man was interviewed, just like um, um, the Leonard gentleman in the studio has said that this is international best practice. Journalists always have their way uh, to, you know, around these things. But um, I did ask a question as to why it's taking this long to be able to apprehend this guy. But then we also know that this is not a traditional warfare. We're fighting a guerrilla warfare. Uh, why do you think it's taken government so long to deal with this issue? Well, um, the war on uh, terror and insurgency is always uh, like this because it's an asymmetric warfare, is a non-positional warfare, and um, and you rightly uh, described it as uh, a guerrilla warfare. In a guerrilla warfare, uh, it takes uh, quite a lot because. Um, the enemies are not uh, well positioned where you can take them out or confront them uh, positionally. Once a war is not positional, it's difficult to really predict uh, the form and the, the proper response that will give you the desired result. I read uh, the um, statement issued by Kuriwa, um, signed by the National uh, um, Coordinator, Comrade Daimanuel Longubiko. I understand his concern that there appears to be reluctance on the part of uh, the federal government to deal uh, with the Turuji factor by taking him out. I really don't uh, see how federal government would um, want to preserve a Turuji. There is no point, there is no need, and um, there is no evidence that he has um, crossed their path properly and um, they let him off the hook. I, I have no idea, I have, I have followed the reports here and there, and uh, what we have seen has not uh, uh, shown any uh, evidence to collaborate the position of Guriwa that the federal government is playing a sub double standards with uh, the case of uh, Toruji. Uh, but that said, I am also not uh, um, uh, quite uh, satisfied with uh, the way Amana the federal government has gone uh, about uh, it's an overall engagement with um, with the with the with the terror terror groups in the country. If um, you take, uh, for instance, the way they have responded to uh, the issue of dealing with the killer headsmen, um, you will see some differential uh, and the indifferent uh, treatment in that direction. You did. I am not aware of any serious uh, persecution. I am not aware of any serious attacks. And yet, these people are known to have killed and maimed. And um, it's such a um, differential treatment is uh, what um, Uriwa uh, appears to be uh, a, you know, a pointing to. But I don't think it applies to the case of Turuji, personally. And um, I am also uh, uh, not happy with the way they have gone about the prosecution of uh, uh, Nam Bekano. Uh, my concern is uh, the way Amana he was uh, brought uh, back to the country. He was extraordinarily renditioned from Kenya to Nigeria. Uh, um, for me, uh, that, that, that is a, a criminal process. You know, and uh, if indeed the federal government wants uh, justice for Omnam the Kano, the federal government will uh, naturally go for its extradition, as um, the American government is, is doing with um, the case of Abba Kiari at the moment. So what stopped the Nigerian government from applying to the Kenyan uh, authorities for Nam Bikani to be um, properly extradicted from Kenya to complete uh, his uh, criminal uh, trial in Nigeria? That wasn't done. He was um, simply kidnapped. And um, state uh, kidnap of a, of, a, of a citizen from another country. But, uh, but, the, but the federal so government so does so have an excuse of saying that this man had two shorties, if not three, he skipped, um, you know, um, that particular 
arrangement that he had with these shorties. I remember when the court kept asking for those shorties to produce Namdi Kanu. He was not supposed to in any way leave the country, and he, he did. I'm not in any way sitting here as a legal person to you know justify what the government did. But well, that's the that, excuse that's the government a, is giving. He jumped bail, right? Yes, he uh, did jump you know, bail. All, uh, what, all you're trying to uh, put across is that Namdi Kanu jumped bail. And that's, that's what the you're excuse the federal government is well, giving. Well, I don't know. As a, as a journalist, I'm aware that you should be aware that uh, Operation Python Dance, you know, invaded his house and people died there. If he was available when the invasion happened, that um, got uh, a number of people killed within the father's compound, he himself could have been a victim. So if uh, the federal government wanted him back, you know, to the court um, when uh, he violated the conditions of um, his bail, what to do was very simple. They, they would have just uh, revoked the bail. And um, revoking it would mean that uh, he could be could have been rearrested rather than Operation Python dance. So if you if you look at it from that pers perspective, you will see that federal government itself is not uh, blameless in uh, in uh, um, his so-called uh, 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 jumping of bail because um, the federal government had uh, had other things had uh, official processes through which to bring it back to the courts. They didn't do that. Instead, they launched military operation which uh, took some people out hmm. in his father's house where he was so the question is if he didn't run you know couldn't he have been one of those that were killed that's the question and uh, so for me whether or not he jumped a uh, babe is uh, is arguable hmm. uh, given the fact that uh, he was actually uh, forced out uh, and, and made to flee uh, for okay. his own life it's only a tree that would hear that it, it would be killed and uh, still uh, stays uh, or moved so, okay. and that's said again, I, the, the other point I'm trying to make is that kidnapping him in Kenya, the, the, it cannot be justified even if he jumped bail. If he jumped bail and he tracked him down to Kenya, what you will do as a sovereign state is, is to apply for his uh, extradition. There is no rule that says that uh, because he jumped bail, he could be kidnapped. You don't do that. Nations don't go into such uh, actions. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, it's roguery. It's, it's not done. Nigeria is a big country and should live by example. Okay. Now, it's an extraordinary rendition from Kenya back to Nigeria to stand trial. For me, it's a travesty of justice. And does okay. not in any way really show that can we get a fair trial in the end. All as right. far as I am concerned, because the desperation is too much. I believe okay. uh, he should have been he should have been extradicted. But, I don't believe he will get trial All right. in the end. All right, let me come back to you, Raymond. Uh, he's making an interesting case. And this is some of the, 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 the issues that most of these journalists and other people who are critics uh, of the government make. Um, they point to what happened to um, the Yoruba non-state actor, Iboho, what happened in his residence. And of course, what happened with the Operation Python dance uh, and how the federal government went about it. Now. Let's, let's, let's look at it. These two men um, who have been called enemy of the state, as opposed to those who are killing in the northwest, in the northeast, um, those who are still killing all the way down south into the middle belt, they have not necessarily shed blood, nor have they taken up arms to kill Nigerians. Um, so what is exactly the yardstick that government is using to term these people as terrorists? For Sunday Boho, he was calling on a protest and asking for a secession. And, and by, by any rule, I mean, according to the human rights of every person across yeah. nations, you have a right to ask for, you know, um, independence. It's an ask. It's not necessarily... Maybe government was afraid that it was a movement, but I'm, I'm looking at all of these men. Let's place all of them on the table side by side with the people that we call terrorists, the people who are indeed terrorists and that are terrorizing us as we speak. Um, are they getting a fair trial? Okay, well, um, thank you very much. That is quite a loaded one. Now, um, what constitutes terrorism under the Terrorism Prevention Act 2015 has, is wide in terms of its construction. So, whereas um, the terrorists so-called, as we like to, uh, like the Boko Haram members, the bandits, these are people who have clearly taken up arms against the state. 
So for them, uh, it is not difficult to say that they are actual terrorists. But in the case of the Boko Haram guys, they have actually declared a war against the Federal Republic of Nigeria. So they are terrorists. So it is easy to uh, disentangle their, their own case. Now, in the case of Sunday uh, Iboho and Namdi Kanu, for Sunday Iboho, his, his uh, campaign started off as, um, as an ethnic nationalism campaign calling for a declaration of a Yoruba nation. Now, Nigeria is a sovereign state. And um, the constitution says that Nigeria is one indis indivisible and indissoluble entity under God. Now, the very moment any group under whatever guise within a sovereign state begins to take part in activities that appears to or that has potential of challenging the territorial and or the sovereignty of the state, at that point, they constitute uh, they constitute a threat to the continuous existence of Nigeria as one indivisible and indissoluble nation. So even if they have not taken up arms and perhaps burning governmental institutions or killing members of the public, it puts that, that intent puts them within the realm of a threat to the state. And to that extent, government has a higher responsibility to protect the state and other members of the society. Uh, uh, so we, as we, much as we don't have time, let me quickly tell you why I'm asking this. Yes. Because there's, a, there's room for radicalization when government goes ahead uh, to deal with these issues if it's not done properly. If, if, yes, yes you know, when they cross the, the line. Exactly. When they cross the line, government has to intervene. So who's to say, and I know you don't work for the government, but my guys are saying time is up. Uh, who's to say that the way and manner in which these non-state actors are being dealt with will mm -hmm. not radicalize more people and give them more sympathizers or followers. I mean, we're seeing what's happening in the Southeast now. So could government have gone about this I, a different I, way? I, I quite agree. It's a very delicate situation to handle because these are people whose gospel appeal to a whole lot of followers when you go back to the, to the uh, corners of the country. So, and this is the point where government perhaps has to be more delegates and in, in handling the situation so that they don't end up making these guys matters as it were uh, and heroes because when you go to the east where I come from Nambikanu is seen as, as, as a folk hero uh, you know who are willing to die for him so uh, so that's the point where government has to be careful so that you try to balance both competing interests so you don't end up creating uh, making a very uh, an already bad situation Complicated. Become bad. Well, unfortunately, our time is up. I want to say thank you. Raymond Kanabe is a legal practitioner and Dr. Law Mefo is a public policy analyst. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for being part of the conversation. Thank you for having me, Mary. Thank, thank you, you. All right. Well, thank you all for staying with us as we round off the show today. We're going to be talking with Nigerians who are expressing their thoughts as regards the APC crisis. I am Mary Anakon. I'll see you tomorrow when Plus Politics returns. Just Thank one or two things before the APC convention. Maybe they might, if they need to postpone it, fine, they can postpone it. But if there is no much need at all, let them go ahead and uh, do the convention so that they can able to have one agreement with each other within the parties. So that so by then, by by do by then, the country and the the election can be very free, free and fair election. Thank you. I said they should put their house in order, hmm? so as not to avoid having a, a, a rowdy convention. Uh -huh. Whether consensus or whatever, they should put their house in order. It's a ruling party. They cannot take us to 2023 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20 in a rowdy manner. That will be catastrophic for the party. I think it's better for them to solve their leadership crisis because if they go on without solving it, they may happen that they have to come back and start solving, uh, and start uh, doing the convention again. First of all, we have to know that the end justifies the means, and um, a house that is united can can withstand any form of opposition that it faces. So I think the best thing for them is for them to put their house in order first. Let everybody have a common goal. Let everybody have a common interest then you can come out and now want to do whatever you want to do. Because when there's disunity right now, or when the house is divided right now, even if you hold your convention, there's every possibility that any, any, any um, resolution that is 
that is passed or any resolution they they come to an end to or maybe don't agree to would not be you know, won't be what is united or it won't be a common interest of everybody since they have not settled their rift yet. So the best thing is for them to settle their rift, put their house in order first. And when they are done with that, then they could down, go on with their convention and from there on maybe things will now work out fine for them.